<laughs> oh, it takes a second? Oh, I see. Fine. Experimenting with technology, it always fails. Um, so, right, I just wanted to kind of clarify a couple points which I didn't quite go into yesterday. Um, there was a space of holomorphic maps, uh, theta holomorphic maps, and what I really wanted to say was that, um, well, the space, of course, um, the energy of a map <coughs> is always non, uh, non-negative. So if E is less than zero, then the space is empty. Um, and then also, I want to kind of restrict to s stable maps. So, so um, that means that either E is greater than zero or um, K is greater than two. Here, K is the number of marked points on the boundary minus one. So that means you have at least three marked points. And then what I forgot to say yesterday was that I really want to look at uh, this space, which is um, this one divided by automorphisms of the disk, otherwise known as PSL2R. Um, and this acts on that by the obvious thing. Um, so uz goes to u composed with phi and say phi inverse of z like that. Um, and finally, that's not even enough. I want to look at the compactification by stable maps, which is really the crucial point. Um, and maybe in light of that, the pictures I drew at the end of last lecture to explain these A and uh, these A-infinity relations make a little bit more sense. So, and I still have all my evaluation maps, as usual, which map um, this thing to um, the intersection of Lij minus 1 and Lij. Let's call this J here. Okay. So they extend. That was, I wanted to, I'm going to this because I do want to actually compute something at some point. And if I ever get there, I'll actually want to know what those spaces are a little bit more precisely. Um, so right, so a stable map just, um, you know, if we're talking about, say, a map from the disk, let's suppose we look at, I don't know, L. Uh, let's consider let's consider the case where, say, all the L i j uh, are equal to L for a fixed L. So we just look at so then they certainly intersect cleanly because they just intersect in a, a fixed uh, manifold. And then a stable map, an example of one of those would be like you know if this is a disk map, then you could also get you know things like this, or you could also get things like that. And you could have you know sort of arbitrary trees of such things going in each possible direction, and um, this is like each, a. Each component other than the original than one disk would be P one. Uh, no, so this is this is supposed to be a disk, um, and this is supposed to be a P one, and so you can have either disks or P ones, and the mark points will spread themselves around on the boundaries. One. There can be like an arbitrary number of P1s, and uh, number of an arbitrary number of disks. The, to the total number will be bounded um, uh, by the energy, of course, because any non-constant disk well, will take up a certain amount of energy, and it has to take up a certain like minimum amount of energy, and so on and so forth. Um, and Right, and, and they have to fit together in a way that, like, they, you know, the kind of intersection 
graph is, is genus zero and so on and so forth. Um, all right, so this, so this stable math compactification is really kind of the, the, the main point in this construction. Uh, the sort of like virtually at least the co-dimension of some stratum involving you know disks and you know stable disk maps with many nodes will be just um, is going to be the number of uh, uh, boundary nodes. So here's a boundary node, here's a boundary node. Um, and well, they, they have to connect only to other disks because if you had um, <coughs> if you had like disks connecting through P1s, that would be considered higher genus because you'd have you know it would be like yeah um, so twice the number of interior nodes. In particular, if you just look at sort of boundary, con boundary contributions, then, then you get only sort of like the boundary of this moduli space, virtually speaking, is just where you have a single node on the boundary. <clears throat> so, so, so you have a tree of disks, and so on every disk there grows a tree of P1s, yeah? That's correct. Exactly. So yeah, you could have here a, a tree of huh? A forest of P1s. A forest of P1s. So you have a forest of P1s growing out of a uh, tree of disks. Um, <laughs> and so the codimension one boundary, and this is real. This is the real codimension, right? So this is why um, you get kind of a infinity relations here. The codimension one boundary is, you know, just sort of disks joined at a single point. And that's why you get compositions of uh, infinity operations when you look at the, um, the co-dimension one boundary inside of the space of stable maps. So just uh, explaining something to the end of last lecture. Another thing, um, so I was tacitly assuming um, that, well, sort of, all my Lagrangians were compact. Um, and this is probably not the right assumption to make for uh, studying Foucault categories of quiver varieties and so on. It's not, strictly speaking, necessary. But once you don't make it, then the things I'm saying become more complicated. So I'm going to make that assumption. I'm going to continue making that assumption. Um, I'll tell you exactly where I'm using this assumption. Um, it hasn't come yet, so I didn't really cheat that badly. Um, and I have to assume that sort of M is, if it's not compact, then it should be somehow, or somehow well behaved at infinity. So in particular, some, something like the injectivity radius shouldn't get too small as you go to infinity, and maybe you need some bounds on curvature, and so on and so forth. And um, let's not get into that. Uh, but I think that's something which should be somehow almost always true. If I take an affine uh, complex variety of algebra. That will definitely be true. But if you take like a quiver variety, it should also be true, I would guess. I mean, um, things that arise from symplectic quotients generally tend to be cool in this way. Um, That's right. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, right. So I mean, all throughout, I'm you know, even when I when I don't have a hypercalar variety, I could talk to the, like the Riemannian metric associated to um, my symplectic form together with some almost complex structure, and then um, 
and then these statements would make sense. And these are a priori not good statements to make in the world of subjective geometry, but somehow they can still be made. I would say the place to look for a real clear understanding of that would be a uh, recent work by Grohman, um, which I think is kind of like the state of the art on that. Um, so back to what we were doing. So we, con we constructed these um, maps, mk, from, say, cf of, OK, so let me just list sort of like a summary. So given we have this set of Lagrangians, um, and let's call it L. And then uh, for any two Lagrangians, um, we could look at what will come to be its, um, in some sense, morphism space, um, which is this floor. Um, floor, I'm calling it a complex, but it's not yet a complex in any reasonable way. Um, CF star LILJ. And then in, in addition, we had these maps MK from CF LI0 I1 tensor up to CF LI K minus 1 LI K. And those went to CF LI0 LI K. OK? And th those came from looking at these um, evaluation maps, push-pull push, kind of construction, very similar to the Witten theory. And, um, and well, you'd like to say some sense that this gives rise to uh, an A-infinity category or a, um, you should be able to take cohomology and get a regular category. But there's this nasty thing, M0, which, um, which means that actually we don't have a differential in any of these complexes. So for example, we have that m1 squared of alpha is going to be equal to m1, uh, sorry, m2, m0, and alpha plus minus 1 to the alpha plus 1, m2, alpha, m0. OK, so m1 squared doesn't equal to 0. Uh, the way that you fix this is, um, so alpha is just a, so if we're talking about m1, then that's going to be mapping, um, m1 will be mapping, say, cf of l uh, i l j to itself. And now we want to say that it squares to 0, so alpha is just an element here. OK. Um, So to fix this and to actually get some, hot, some sort of, oh, I will move to the other side. OK. Um, so sometimes it happens that just m0 happens to be 0 for some reason. Um, so that's called tautologically unobstructed. Then, uh, then you get, of course, m1 squared is equal to 0. And you have an honest to goodness uh, infinity category. And you can just stop there. Um, if not, then what you want to do is instead of looking at just Lagrangians, you want to look at pairs of Lagrangians and solutions to the Markratan equation associated with, with each Lagrangian. So uh, if not, um, for each uh, Li, choose um, bi, which is going to be in the um, 
uh, floor complex of Li with itself, and uh, such that the sum of these guys is equal to 0. And this is what we call a, in Fukaya and uh, O and Ota and Ono, um, call a bounding chain, just a Markiton element. And well, then you can kind of redefine. Uh, so what, why can you choose it? So you may not be able to choose. Um, um, it's possible. All right. So um, you know, for those which you can't find a solution, just throw them out. Uh, can you choose the i equal to zero? So if m0 is 0, then yes. Uh, this sum here is uh, okay. uh, over k greater than or equal to 0. Um, you can kill that 0 using this di? That's the idea, yeah. So by the way, this, this guy should have, um, in order for the sum to converge, I should really assume that um, that its norm is less than 1. Then the sum actually converges, because by definition, the mk's all have norm less than or equal to 1. Um, so it happens in, in many cases that, um, that you can choose such a guy. And we'll see an example of that in a second, uh, hopefully. So then you can kind of redefine. Um, so, so you just so if you have now a pair of L i and B i, so you can then define sort of L uh, i B i L j B j. Uh, this is just equal to the same old thing that you had before. Um, but then. Uh, you can define a new, um, say, operation um, um, shoot. I left it all the B's. After all that. Uh, M, B, I, 0. I think I'm going to just put lots of dots here. Um, I, 1, B, I, 1, um, tensor, tensor, whatever, um, goes to, <coughs> you can imagine what it is. Um, so then you're going to define this to be um, alpha 1 up to alpha k. Uh, it's going to be a sum over sort of all possible ways of inserting b's where you can. So um, let's say L um, 0 up to L uh, k. And then we're going to do something like m. Uh, I should call it uh, next letter available will be Q, let's say. Q is equal to, say, uh, K plus L0 up to LK. And then put in here B I um, 0 to the L0 and then alpha 1, then B. Um, I1 to the L1 up to alpha k, um, and then the ik to the um, lk, like so. And then it's easy enough to see that, um, well, sort of. Obviously, then 
m hat 0 is equal to 0 just by this equation. Um, right? And then um, additionally, uh, we have that um, exercise that the m hat also satisfy the a infinity gradation. Yes. So I mean, so some version of this I've seen on the like the holomorphic side where I have like bundles and they're obstructed and you can take some d bar connection. So in this case, what is the thing that's being like, how do you what is what is obstructed in this case? So I mean, you could say it's like this doesn't doesn't work. So you want it want it to be equal to zero, but it's not. But I guess I mean, um, like uh, like geometric like so for instance like you could have a situation where everything is obstructed. And yeah. That's right. You could. So what does that, but, um, what does that mean geometrically, like from a symplectic, you know, and they're obviously still Lagrangians there. Right. But they somehow don't behave well. So for example, you know, in general, you'd like to believe that Lagrangians are somehow rigid objects that you shouldn't be able to sort of like um, translate them away from themselves without get, you know. So for example, if you take a Lagrangian, like a circle in the complex plane, mm -hmm. then it's easy to write just linear Hamiltonian, which translates it away from itself. And this is kind of the reason the circle is bad is because it's obstructed. Um, so, um, although I mean, I'm, I'm strictly speaking going out of the, of the setting of this lecture because I'm talking, I mean, that circle is not now solved zero. But I mean, that's sort of a, you know. And so, what's an example of a symplectic manifold where uh, everything is topologically unobstructed? For example, if you take a, an ex well, what, what often happens is you can look at, you generally have to look at a symplectic manifold, so I mean, uh, plus a Lagrangian, which is sufficiently well behaved. So if you take, say, if you assume that your Lagrangians all have relative pi 2 trivial, then of course it'll be tautologically unobstructed. Um, in a second, we'll see another example of tautologically unobstructed, which you can probably guess what it's going to be. Um, for example, if you just take a holomorphic Lagrangian and a hyperkeller um, guy and take a gener generic. Um, thing on that real circle, whatever you want to call it, then it's going to be tautologically unobstructed. Um, but that somehow, in just a second, I'm going to try to explain why that's not enough. And you have to go a little bit further. So um, I'm not just saying this um, in the abstract. OK. So next thing is that. Um, if you have a, let's say you have a phi t is, uh, say t here runs from 0 to 1, is it, let's say it's a Hamiltonian flow. <coughs> OK, so then the claim is this is going to give us an A infinity functor. Um, Make this converge. Okay. Um, so, given such a Hamiltonian flow, I'm not going to say exactly how it happens, but you're going to get. Uh, um, a s bunch of maps, so that will map, say, f the f floor complex of L um, L i zero L i one up to um, L i k minus one L i k. Two, and now here's the fun part. Um, let's just say that phi is uh, well. Let's say let's not. So, so this is going to be a set of all the phi t, right? So that 
Um, and this is going to be phi 1 of L i k minus 1 phi 1 of L i k. Okay, this functor, of course, depends on the entire family of maps. It's not enough to just know the end product. Um, and, uh, but it nonetheless gives you such a map, and it satisfies some equations. Uh, um, maybe I'll omit them in the interest of saving time. Um, so again, these are given by some geometric uh, argument. And, and the main point here is that, uh, at least for the purposes of this talk, is that uh, if we take some b, and uh, which is, uh, say, b i in l i with itself, uh, then which satisfies the Morakatan equation, then uh, I can get a new such solution of the Morakatan equation for a Hamiltonian isotope of Li. Sorry, that's supposed to be a zero. <laughs> um, and right, and the point here is that f star uh, of b we can define to be just um, f k of b to the k. Uh, this guy is going to be, this is going to be, uh, it's going to belong to the floor chains of phi 1 L i with itself. Okay, and I claim that this also is going to satisfy the Morakatan equation. Um, Um, all right, so, so for example, we might know that Li is tautologically unobstructed, but then we might take some Hamiltonian isotope of that and get something which we have no clue about. Uh, for example, if you take something which is holomorphic Lagrangian and then apply a Hamiltonian flow, it's very easy to see that you know, any reasonable Hamiltonian, well, just any at all, uh, homomorphic Lagrangians are completely rigid. So, um, so <laughs> if you flow them at all, they're going to become not homomorphic Lagrangian. They will become presumably obstructed. And so this gives you a way of trivializing, tri trivializing the obstruction uh, when uh, you know that you come from a Hamiltonian flow of something. So besides that, um, just before we can define floor homology in full generality, uh, we need one more piece of information, which is that, uh, so first of all, let's define floor homology. Uh, supposing we have um, some, well, just like this, we already said that, the floor homology of L i b i and L j b j um, is defined to be the homology of um, the floor complex with respect to M1, the hat version, of course. Which squares to 0. Um, now, if I have, um, 
So, so another basic property of the Fukaya um, category is that if I take um, another property, well, it's a, more like a structure. Um, Well, we get a um let's get these things confused. Um right. So for any so phi phi Hamiltonian flow is before is going to give rise to an element i phi in the floor homology of, say, L i b i and L i f phi star b i. Sorry, and this should be a phi of L i. Um, uh, kind of canonically. And moreover, if we have, say, um, you know, I phi composed with C is going to be I, oh, I didn't say what that was anymore. OK. That's another thing I have to say. Um, of course, we can look at M2. Yeah, out the side of the board. So again, so can you just recap? So you define some functor uh, yeah, over here. And, uh, what was the final conclusion? So the definition doesn't involve this homogeneous flow. It right? well, homogeneous flow was it does. The definition of the functor. Why not? The definition of floor cohomology does not. Right? That's right. And, and so, what's the role of this equality that f was star b i is expanded? Uh, so this is needed to uh, define the functor. This is the definition of floor homology. Uh, this is the first time I defined floor homology. Right. So I mean, I just kind of first defined the functor, then I defined floor homology, and I want to say in which sense floor homology is invariant um, when you look at these. Uh, and what's the role of this identity? This identity yes. is so that, for example, I could afterwards talk about this. So in other words, if I start with something which is, I mean, the simplest thing to think about is if I start with some Li, which is tautologically unobstructed, and so I know there's some solution to Marquardt, and then I move it by Hamiltonian flow. So for example, start with a holomorphic Lagrangian, then flow it. Then I'll get a solution, per perhaps highly non-trivial, to the Marquardt equation on my flowed L. Um, and then I can still define, say, flow homology for the flowed L, even though it's no longer tautologically unobstructed. OK? And, sorry, and again, where does this identity come from? This, is some this identity yeah, this is, is um, that it also satisfies this. It's, uh, it's essentially a trivial exercise. I mean, if you just take the definition of an A infinity functor <coughs> and you plug it into this equation, it will just, um, so I mean, I didn't write the relation. Um, um, okay, so uh, so now that this only follows from the other identities for these bi's that we wrote. So bi's, so you said that we should choose them. So we chose, yeah. So we and those constraints imply. The bi's satisfy the Morgan equation. And then if I now apply f star, which I define this way, to bi, mm -hmm. I do again. it will again satisfy the Morgan equation. Oh, this is yeah, this is the definition. I'm sorry. OK. So I want to say that this, this sort of element, this canonical element in the flow homology between Lagrangian and its Hamiltonian isotope is somehow functorial.
before, to, say, to say that, I need to say what um, composition is in, in the cohomology le level Foucault category. It's in a sense almost ob I mean, it's essentially obvious, but um, I just should write it in order to make sense of what I'm saying. Um, so we have a map from H, F, uh, you know, L, I, 0, I, 1, uh, P, I, 0, L, I, 1, P, I, 1. This is a horrible notation. Um, L, I, 1, P, I, 1. Call this the composition map. Um, so then it goes by um, if you take the classes associated to some guy, say alpha one, and you compose it with alpha 2, and I'm doing my compositions backwards because I can't tell right, right from left. Um, this is, you know, goes to the class of m2 uh, alpha 1, alpha 2. And if you want this to actually be associative, you have to correct this by a sine minus 1 to the alpha because we're converting from an A infinity category with the standard A infinity signs to, a, to an actual category. Um, so, and the reason this thing is actually descends to cohomology is because uh, of the infinity relations. Um, okay, now I can go back and say what properties this I satisfies. Okay, and uh, then we get, if we have, say, Hamiltonian isotopies and we compose them, we're going to have, say, I of phi composed with psi is going to be uh, I of phi composed with I of psi, perhaps with the order of composition reversed. I'm not going to try to figure that out. Um, and also we know that I of the identity map is equal to the unit inside of, I mean, there is a unit, uh, let's say, uh, some L i b i with itself, so it's a unit of this. So I mean, this guy itself is an, it's just a, it's a ring, because you have this uh, composition on it, so it's a unit of ring under, OK, in particular, uh, what we get is that, um, so composition with H, F, L, say, um, L prime is going to be uh, is going to be isomorphic to HF, um, and these with perhaps, you know, LB and L prime and B prime is going to be isomorphic to uh, LB and L prime, well, phi L prime and F phi star uh, B prime. Okay, and this isomorphism is given to, uh, is given by composition with, uh, composition with this guy I phi. All right, so what is the upshot of this?
So up till now, we've been saying that we assume just all the Li intersects cleanly. Um, suppose now, say L and L prime don't uh, intersect cleanly. So then I can define the floor homology of an L and L prime. Um, um, just define it to be what you get by taking a small um, Um, a small Hamiltonian isotopy and applying it. Okay, so now let's go to back to hyperkeller situation. Okay, so um, I mean, it is an issue, okay. but um, what we can, I mean, if you want to actually define a category which, say, includes Lagrangians which don't intersect um, transversely, then you can, well, what you could do is you could just move one of them, uh, you know, if it's a finite number, I think it's not so hard to just move. Um, you can replace one with its Hamiltonian isotope, and so on and so forth until you get a collection which does intersect cleanly. But the only problem with that is that um, eventually you, assuming you're dealing with some kind of countable number of Lagrangians, which is generally a reasonable assumption. Uh, the Well, I mean, this one Lagrangian, then perturbing another Lagrangian with a different, probably different. So I, I mean, I, I, I don't. So I mean, in the usual setting that you have to do with sort of, um, like the reason I kind of dealt with cleanly intersecting was because I didn't want to deal with sort of like morphisms from Lagrangians to itself in a in a by perturbing it a billion times, um, which uses at least a kind of a mess. I think um, to just make. A, say, a countable number of Lagrangians all be, uh, all intersect cleanly with one another is, is something which is perfectly fine. And because of this, you don't really lose any information depending on how you perturb them. Um, I'm making this definition because I want to talk about the flow homology of just two fixed Lagrangians, which might not be intersecting cleanly. If I just want to look at a category, then um, I don't think this would um, be a serious problem. So, um, so let's go back to hyperkeller case. So, to um, M hyperkeller, and then we'll be looking at, say, omega equals say omega j for. Um, It's a reasonable assumption. And then, yeah. Um, I knew there was a reason I should have said tame instead of compatible. At the beginning of my talks, I talked about something called uh, omega compatible, almost complex structure. There's a weaker notion called tame, which I think I'm going to just use without explaining because it's well known. And so everything I said will work perfectly well for tame ones as well. So let's look at omega is omega j. And now let's assume the li are, um, are i holomorphic. 
that means that, um, for example, omega i restricted to L i zero. Um, then, so the first thing, so the theorem from last time, which says that basic, basically there are no non-constant um, So for generic theta in um, this set Ri, a circle, um, there is, um, you have a, a theta holomorphic map it had to be constant. OK, so what does this say about um, the Fukai category in this situation, floor homology? Well, um, first of all, Li. So for generic theta in Ri. So it's going to be omega tame if it's close enough to J. Um, close enough to J um, to be omega tame. Um, the Li are tautologically unobstructed. And also, we'll get immediately that the um, center of the same assumptions for generic theta close enough to J um, will have the uh, floor homology of Li and Lj, assuming yeah, Lij, Li and Lj are clean intersection, um, Li intersect cleanly, then the floor homology, well, all the contributions to M1, which didn't come from uh, just the artificial adding in of the exterior differential, will simply be zero because they'll just, you know, all the maps are constant. And so that means that they're not stable. Um, so is equal to um, it's just the, the Duram cohomology of um, the intersection between Li and Lj shifted by uh, I'm supposed to say the following. The and Duram you coma. Uh, Sorry? Please remind Ri was a circle um, of A J plus B K such that um, Okay, so this will just be a sum over C components of Li intersect Lj, uh, cohomology of C with coefficients in lambda shifted by MC. And uh, this is just because, um, because um, if K is equal to 1 and U is constant, then it's not stable. So essentially all we have left over is m1 is equal to d. And um, finally, if we look at um, the floor homology of, how much time do I have left? Not very much. 
Li with itself, um, then so this is going to be um, is actually going to be uh, as a ring the cohomology of Li with coefficients in lambda. This is still under the same assumptions. Um, as a ring, it will be this thing. Um, yeah. OK. So now, this leads to the question of, I mean, there's another way of producing this kind of answer for two holomorphic Lagrangians in a holomorphic symplectic manifold, which is given by, I think, what people call virtual DRAM cohomology, um, which involves there's different constructions. I'm not an expert on any one of them. Um, one of them is due to Berend Fantecki. Uh, one of them is due to Joyce and, and other collaborators. Um, and uh, I believe there are other approaches as well. Well, um, this associates to, I think, this is the holomorphic. I mean, we don't actually need hypercalar for that matter. It can just be like, um, this is M uh, holomorphic symplectic. OK, and L, I are holomorphic Lagrangian. <coughs> then, so you, you can construct a, so you get a, a perverse sheaf. on L, I intersect L, J, which when you take its um, cohomology, you're going to get back, well, if they intersect cleanly, it'll be the Duram cohomology. And if not, it gives you something which is a candidate for the floor homology, um, defined as we did for a non-cleanly intersecting one. In other words, take this guy, push it off itself, um, and look at the floor homology of its Hamiltonian isotope. Um, in some model case of the tangent bundle and stuff, you'll get some vanishing cycle shape, I think. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, candidate for HF um, LI LJ. So, I mean, and here I can look at sort of the trivial bounding chain on each of them. And then when I isotop one from itself, maybe that bounding chain will become highly non-trivial. But I'll, then I'll get a well-defined floor homology. And I can hope that it agrees with the cohomology of this perverse sheaf. Um, and this theorem gives a kind of a, you know, so a priori floor homology is a very global sort of a thing. It can, you know, take into account homomorphic curves which go anywhere inside of your manifold. But it follows again from this theorem that um, speci specifically the case where, you know, maybe the Lagrangians don't intersect cleanly, which is, uh, as I said in the beginning, technically somewhat involved. Um, well, what you want to say is that. Um, So this, this, of course, was defined to be you know, HF of L, shoot, I'm not supposed to write there. Um, so HF of L, by definition, that was HF of Li0 and say Lj pushed by some Hamiltonian isotopy until it intersect, intersects cleanly, say transversely. Um, F star B, uh, 0 in this case. 
Okay. The f thing has f. There's f zero, so this is generally something fairly complicated. Um, and so female j is now no longer holomorphic. And now this guy is no longer holomorphic. Um, but what I can do is I can say that as I take this phi sufficiently small, actually all of my holomorphic curves are going to be in a tiny neighborhood around the intersection points of L i and L j. So corollary is all um, holomorphic, theta holomorphic curves um, <coughs> contributing to, um, to this are um, arbitrarily close to um, Li intersect Lj. So that means like there's really a hope that this is the right thing. And to actually show that it's the same is, is, is still, has still not been done. But um, I don't think it's tautological in some sense from an existing theory. But uh, it seems highly um, probable that it's true, um, that these this two, two theories do actually coincide. Um, and one reason why you might be interested in that is that, um, as far as I understand, in this theory, the only thing you can do is define, um, at least to date, although I know people are working on this, um, what you can do is you can define the virtual Duran cohomology of a pair of Lagrangians. But if you say then want to define a composition law between uh, the, from you know, one pair to another pair, then as far as I understand, this sheaf theory construction doesn't yet have a good candidate for that. Whereas in the floor setup, you get that uh, just as part of the general machine. So then, in a sense, this gives one way, you know, conjecturally of defining uh, a category uh, using, you know, where the morphism spaces at least are given sheaf theoretically, but the compositions are somehow involved this floor machinery. I could try then to maybe transfer that to the sheaf theoretic situation, but that would also be perhaps rather non-trivial. Um, in this, um, Usually you kind of put some relative orientation on your Lagrangians before you can um, uh, do this business. Uh -huh. How is that related to once I, once I isotope everything away, what does that turn into? Isotope everything. You know, and, and if I try, if I, let's say, I, I mean, so in their stuff there's actually a little, there's some extra data on That's right, LR. yeah. And what does that turn into in the kind of, in this real Okay, thing? good question. I, I mean, let's talk about this after the talk. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to tell you a good answer on, it, on one foot. Um, I mean, these Lagrangians do come with added information. I, I'm trying to think of whether that's the same as what they need or something different. And then, um, um, so that's, I guess I'm more or less out of time. There's a lot of other things I could say, but yeah, I'm out of time. So. Okay. <laughs>